<laughs> so, whoa, <laughs> pretty. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, I I have a uh, I didn't start off as a photographer in life. I started off as a French horn player. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm probably frowning because I had to wear a skirt that day. But anyway, um, you know, I started out as a, as a as a musician, you know, and I played French horn for many years, and and I um, all through uh, school, and I I got a full scholarship to go to the Cal State University Northridge as a music major, and uh, you know, I didn't really think of myself as a as a creative person. I don't know why, but I I enjoyed playing French horn, but it was never my passion, my true passion in life or whatever. And uh, so after about a year and a half in, in, in school, I just kind of walked away. I just didn't want to do it anymore. I was, I felt like I was really over my head and in, in, at the university level. And I, I walked away and just, you know, started, got a job and started working and, and getting on with my life. And I, you know, I had a lot of guilt and shame about that for a lot of years, you know, that I just kind of passed up that opportunity. Okay. You're frowning. Are you, is everything okay? Okay, so, um, you know, I didn't take up photography until I think it was about 2002, someone gave me a camera and uh, it was a Pentax K1000 or K100, something like that. It's a, it's a fully manual camera and I didn't know anything about photography or cameras. And I went to the local camera store and I asked the guy, is this any good? And, you know, what are all these dials for and numbers and all this kind of stuff? And he said, well, this is a very good camera to start with. He said, uh, it's fully manual. He said, and by the way, I'm teaching a class at the uh, Belmont Community Parks and Rec Center for the next two Saturdays. And so I signed up and I went and I just loved it. And he was, this man was a wonderful teacher and he was able to explain the relationship between the aperture and the shutter speed and depth of field and all. And I, I totally understood what he was talking about. And uh, had it been anybody else, I would never would have had any interest in it. So I was shooting film, you know, we had a little assignment between the two weeks and, you know, depth of field kind of stuff. And uh, so I loved it. You know, I really, I, I really enjoyed photography very much. And I was working in horse racing still. So I practiced a lot on, um, you know, people in the morning when they're exercising the horses and all kinds of in panning and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and at first I started kind of giving away, you know, the images that have them, you know, go to one hour photo every day after work and stuff. And I'd, I'd go to my friend in the camera store and we'd go through all the, you know, it was like Christmas or something, you know, we'd go through all the images and he'd say, no, 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 no. Oh yeah, this one's pretty good. You know, or if you cropped it like this, you could see this happen or that happen. And, uh, and it, you know, I really took to it like a duck in water and, um, I joined the San Mateo um, Camera Club, you know, and I was with them for a couple of years till I moved over here to the East Bay. And I, uh, my friend at the camera store, he said, you know, I, I'm, there's the San Mateo County Fair coming up. He said, I really think you should put some of your work in. And so I put a bunch of my work in and stuff. And I ended up being like artist of the year, you know, in 2000. Four, I think it was at 2003 or 2004. And one of the things that I won um, was I had signed up to go to the University of uh, the, the Academy of Art University in San Francisco for like a hundred dollars. You could, uh, you know, when you put it in this application and I won that scholarship, they gave away two that year. And I don't know if they still do this or not, but, uh, you know, so I took full advantage of that. I think I went to the Academy in, um, 2004 and 2005, um, I could take up to 12 units. I only took about four units, I think, each semester. But I took a couple of Photoshop classes, which I really, really needed. I took some uh, uh, two semesters of printing classes, which I loved printing. You know, um, you know, I didn't know much about Photoshop. I certainly didn't know anything about Macintosh, and and so, you know, that was a great help to me. To, you know, to be able to do that kind of stuff, and. Um, you know, I realized along the way I was enjoying, you know, photography so much. It was using that part of the brain that I used to use for music. And it was like it was. It had just sat there dormant, you know, vacant for all these years. And uh, I remember writing a, a thank you letter to the uh, San Mateo County Fair, you know, for this opportunity. I just burst into tears and I started sobbing. I was at my 
office at work and and I realized why I was upset was I had that chance to go for full circle with here I had another chance you know at, at, a, at a full scholarship something like that so you know the photography has really been my passion all along and in a di different way than music was I liked music I enjoyed it I had a good time but I really have a passion for for photography and um so I just kind of you know kept going with it so uh I, I, a few months ago I think it was probably about five or six months ago I think uh it was Jan asked me if I wanted to do an exhibit for the um post office and I said yeah, and you know we'd been in, in the pandemic, and I hadn't shot anything other than phone pictures, the <laughs> flower pictures, you know, for the last few years. And I, in 2017, I was working at a job, and I I was down at the Monterey Bay Aquarium for the day, and I went in and I took a bunch of pictures. I brought my camera and I took a bunch of pictures, and um, I thought, well, great, you know. And some of you guys in in the photo, you know, the pho photographers group, you know, I've seen my. <laughs> my jellyfish images over the, the last few years. And I, I never really knew what I was going to do with it. So when Jan asked me if I wanted to do the post office, I said, you know, my that's kind of my most recent body of work is all the jellyfish. And I didn't quite know what to do with it. So I went and looked at the space and I thought, you know, this could be aquarium windows, you know, at the post office. And I, I knew that I did not want to mat and frame a bunch of pictures and, and put them up there. It just didn't feel right and I uh, so I thought about it for a little while and I remember going to an exhibit a few years ago where somebody had printed on silk and I thought that's what I want to do you know I want them to be free I want them to be be flowing and stuff like that but I really you know I didn't know anything about that kind of stuff um, you know I have enjoyed printing over the years um, and so I started making research into it and there's a there's a place up in uh Healdsburg it's called Jacquard Inkjet Fabric Systems and what I did I sent away I don't know for 35 or 50 dollars they give you a package of all these swatches of things that are printable materials and stuff like that and so I went through those and and I gotta say you know Betsy and George have helped me a lot along the way so I went over to their house and we went through all these swatches and Betsy had had some experience with a material called Crepe Georgette. And so I went with that material. And um, in the meantime, you know, my images that I'd taken in, in 2017, uh, I accidentally knocked over a hard drive that had all that stuff on there. And I lost the last six years of my work. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. You know, I didn't have it uh, backed up. I thought all, all along, it was like, in the back of my head, I got to back this up. I got to back this up. Again. And so I took the uh, hard drive, which was pretty destroyed, to a guy, uh, and he was able to retrieve some of some of the images and stuff like that. And I gotta say, uh, he gave me stuff that I wasn't intending to get, so I had to make a list of very specifically what I was looking for. And so in the meantime, I went. I had a day off. I'd started working again, and I went down to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And I took a whole bunch more images and stuff because now I didn't have any images, you know, for this project. So I came home with about 500 images from, you know, going down there and went through them. And in the meantime, the guy was able to get the images that I wanted from from 2017. So it worked. And, and he got some of the other stuff that I really, really wanted, the rodeo pictures. I really wanted those back and he was able to get those as well. Um, so... I contacted this company, like I said, and I ordered some of the, a roll of uh, the silk and they have it for different size printers. My, my printer happens to be a 17 inch uh, and that's the smallest that you can get for this roll. And it's, um, it's like a 30 foot roll and it, uh, the silk is kind of laid on top of like a wax paper. It's kind of adhered to it loosely. So it helps it feed through the printer you know, with that paper. So then after you get done printing, you peel off that wax paper and, and throw it away. And, and then you've got your silk, which is kind of hard to work with when it doesn't have any of the backing on it. And I had some issues with the printer, the silk coming apart from the, as it's feeding through the printer, it would get bound up in my printer machine and all that stuff. So um, about halfway through the roll, it, it kind of started behaving 
you know, acting right. And I'd done some uh, proofs on it and I wasn't really happy with what I'd got. So I had to find some other people that, that knew about how to print on silk. And I contacted Cannoli and he, he didn't have any experience with silk. Um, so I called the company that I bought the material from and they gave me somebody's name, a uh, fellow down in uh, South San Francisco that has a huge printing business apparently. And um, he gave me some of the parameters and, and you know some of the, the things to know about printing on silk. Um, and then Betsy had a friend, Charles Bow. Bo, I think he's over in, uh, he has a gallery in San Rafael. And he was also really, really helpful about, uh, you know, how to, how to print on silk. So um, I'll kind of go through, um, oh boy, let's see. So when I took these pictures, you know, of, this is how they come out when, when you take them at the, um, at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And I didn't like, I don't like the blue background and the orange things. So I then kind of made them into black and white. And some of the images are super uh, black and they're really dark and they're really heavy. And I didn't like that. So then I inverted them and I got something more like this. So I like that a lot better. It's not so heavy looking. And, uh, and so I started printing on silk and then I realized that, you know, some of the ones had shadings and things like that in the back and I needed to have them all in um, uh, all the backgrounds in totally white. So I had to like select them and then I could, you know, move them onto the making the panels and stuff like that. And then I could also, uh, uh, oops, hold on one sec. What am I trying to do here? I don't think I can do it. Anyway, you can um, you can move them around. You can size them. You can make them bigger, smaller, uh, rotate them, things like that. Uh, and it was super challenging trying to figure out how I wanted to make the panels. You know. Um, so I, I printed up some panels and I went, took them over to Betsy and George's. They're five foot long. And I am, was using, uh, not the silk, uh, I used the, the silk for only some a few proofs until I got the printing process down. And I used a roll of, uh, it's like a proofing paper. It's um, uh, Epson professional paper is what it's called. And it's like 131 feet in the whole roll. And it's pretty cheap. It was like 30, 30 bucks or so. So I would print up these panels and I'd take them over to Betsy and George's and we'd look at them. And, um, and it was really a struggle to figure out how to make them work. And so I kind of divided them into categories. You know, there's like four different types of jellyfish. So I put them each in those categories and then I would transfer them onto the, the silk panels and I would play with the sizing and stuff like that. Cause you make them all the same size, it's kind of boring. So I, I had to, um, Betsy encouraged me. She said, you know, one of these days, it's just going to click. You're going to know how to do it. And so I just kept playing with it and playing with it. And I found out that I needed to have the jellyfish that could have some kind of a relationship with each other. And, and then I could put them, whether it was two or three or four jellyfish at a time. And so that's kind of how I was able to uh, come up with the, the panels. Um, yeah, and I have some panels. Where are they? Oh, so here's an example of a panel. And again, I have layers so I can turn them off and on and I can rotate them around or whatever. Uh, there's some other, there's another one. Um, and then, um, so when I've kind of finalized what panels I wanted to use, I uh, went back over to Betsy and George's and in their basement, they have a, a, a big room down there. And so we taped off the size of the room and kind of figured out how to, which order I wanted to put the panels in, you know, which one's in front. Some of them ones in front have spinners on them so they can actually turn around. Uh, and some of them are, are stationary. So we were able to do that. There I am taping them up. And, uh, and then this is, um, after we'd hung all the panels, the printed panels, I had not taken the backing off of them. 
And so we decided to take the backing off of just one of them because it was still a couple of weeks before um, we were going to hang the exhibit. And I didn't want to the more you mess with it, the more strings hang off of it and, and it gets kind of hard to work with. So this is an image of, I, I'm pulling the, the, the wax paper off of the back and, and that's, the, um, that's the printed panel right there. So uh, install day was probably the hottest day of the year and George uh, was there to help and Betsy was there to help. And um, I put up my signage and stuff like that. It was very hot. And I used the rocks that were in the previous display from um, Betsy's display that was up. And, and I thought it was kind of cool to use it. So we left that in there. Um, here's George helping. He did a wonderful job. He's, he's just a wonderful guy. Um, so that's about it. You know, this, I took this picture. It was one night and um, I thought it came out. I, you know, I like it at night. I have some cards down here in the bottom that I, printed up and I, I put down that were, you know, are for sale or whatever. And um, that's about it. So now it's time for questions if you have any. <laughs> love, love, love them, Nora. Tell me again, the Jacquard place. What was uh, Yes, let me. And, but did that end up not being what you used anyway? I mean. No, it was what I used. Okay. So this is the name of the, place, Jacquard Inkjet Fabric Systems.com. And you can call them and talk to them. I mean, they're, to me, their website was super overwhelming because they've got all this material in rolls and uh, some of it's been processed somewhat and some of it's raw silk and, and all kinds of stuff. And I mean, they have uh, polyesters, poplin, lycra, charmuse, habitoy, silk satin, Fuji. I mean, it just, it goes on and on and on. So, and there's a couple of different processes that work. Uh, one of the processes works with inkjet printers and the other one works with the, um, uh, what do you call the heat? heat transfer? Laser jet, the yeah, laser jet. Thank you, yeah, laser jet, exactly. So um, does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Okay. Uh, Nora? Yes. You said you transferred your uh, selected photos onto the silk. Uh, how did you do that? Or did you print the selection, the, the ones you wanted onto the silk? So what I created in Photoshop were panels that were 17 inches wide, five feet long. And so I would just drag, you know, it was like a, you know, I'd, I'd make a, a 17 inch by five foot long blank sheet of paper, you know, blank in my, in Photoshop. And then I would drag from Photoshop the image onto those panels. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of trouble also. I have, my, my computer's 10 years old. And so my computer couldn't handle the file size of all these panels, you know, and my computer was crashing and it was uh, corrupting the files and all kinds of stuff. So then I had to go through upgrading, you know, my software as, as much as I could for as old as my computer is. And then you, then you find out, you know, that things, other uh, uh, applications that I use were not compatible, you know, with the newer system or the older system. And, and so that was, I'm sure you all have experienced that lovely nightmare of when you change computers uh, or do anything like that, upgrade stuff. So did that explain your question, Carol? So you had a blank, large strip of regular paper, and then you had a, a printed out panels, and you transferred the printed onto the blank. Uh, Oops, let me, let me see if I can do this. Okay, so here's a panel. And right now it's blank. So I took an image and I drug it onto the canvas and put it, positioned it how I wanted it. And then I found another image to put on there and another image. I, I see. But then, Does that make sense? I think Carol's, Carol, I, I think your question is, how did you get from the paper to the silk or the fabric. Okay, so once I made this panel, then I then I would uh, flatten the image, 
And then I would send it to my, I would load up my printer with the silk, the roll of silk, and you know, give it the command to print the silk from my computer. Does that make sense? It does. What kind of printer did you have? Do you, did you? Uh, I have an Epson P5000. Now, did the silk have backing as it went through the printer? Yes, it had like kind of like a wax paper almost that it was kind of, it wasn't super sticky on there, but it was enough to hold it so that the, you know, that paper would feed the silk through the printer. And then when you're done, uh, when you're ready, then you peel the backing off and you have what's left, you know, is printed on the silk. Did you have to make any special adjustments in the printer to allow that? That would be thicker than normal paper. Um, um, what I had to do was talk to people that knew how to do that. And so they gave me the parameters, you know, like you have to use the largest platen gap and, and I had to use, uh, figure out which profiles to use. And they told me, you know, use uh, matte paper, um, Epson matte paper or exhibition paper. Uh, for the profiles in order for the images to come out properly. Does that make sense? The exhibit you have at the post office, that's um, silk? Yes, it's all, uh, it's called Crepe Georgette is the silk. And I think it's a kind of a raw silk that they make. I have a point to go down there and see it. I, I'm really, really uh, impressed with what you've done, Nora. And it sounds Thank you. Sounds like something I'd like to do. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Carol. Yeah, it's up for another week. Um, it'll be coming down on the 7th and then Nancy will be moving in with her exhibit, so. <laughs> well, Nora, I, I wanna thank you too for the photograph you took that you just showed of the exhibit because when I was down there during the day, it's impossible to photograph. Right. <laughs> during yeah, the day. Really is. Yeah. Yeah, nighttime's a good time to go and yeah. try and take a picture of the photograph of the of the how many products options. did you experiment with before you selected the one that you found the best to display your your artwork on um once i got all those swatches that i showed you you know there's like probably 60 or 70 swatches the samples that the, the company had sent me um we went through and selected a couple and like I said, Betsy had had some experience working with the Crepe Georgette. She knew somebody that had done some work on there. So that's how we selected that one. Uh, and um, so I just stuck with that. You know, the other, the other thing was finding some cheap roll paper that I could do proofs on, you know, that wasn't gonna break the bank. Cause this, this um, rolls of silk, I gotta, I gotta tell you are pretty expensive. Um, it was about $175 for the 130 foot by 17 inch wide roll. And uh, I needed two rolls for that. And the second time when I called them and, and I ordered another uh, roll, she said, oh, it's a good thing you're ordering this now. And I go, oh, why is that? And she goes, because we're not gonna carry it anymore. And I said, why is that? She said, because it's too expensive. <laughs> so mm -hmm. so there, there probably are some, some less expensive products, but I didn't investigate that. I didn't look into that. So I was pretty, Okay, I, I think we've about uh, reached the end of our oh, yeah. questions. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and uh, you can always get a uh, contact um, if, uh, Nora Lee if you, if you want to ask her some more. But it's thank you so much, Nora. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. And then it was great. It was great. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to introduce our, our next speaker, who is Casey Smith, she's a new member of Arts Apart Richmond and her two dimensional mixed media artworks cover collage, acrylics and weaving and it shows her love of pattern, color and fabric. And uh, here she is. Hi, thanks. Thanks, Irene. Um, thanks for everybody. Hope you can hear me. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, I, I live in Richmond in the North and East. I've lived here since 2008. Um, and I've been a member of AOPR since July. So, um, not that long. I was introduced to the group by Brian McGilloway and Mindy Pines, who are both friends of mine. Um, so I'm happy to 
be meeting everybody and be part of this group. And thank you for having me <laughs> here today. Um, this is my first time really thinking about the trajectory of my art path. So it's been it's been kind of nice to be able to prepare for this because it it did get me thinking about it. And um, that was something I hadn't really done before. So um, let me see here. I'm going to share my screen. And let's see. My present, my slideshow is pretty image heavy. Um, so we're all going to figure out together if I'm able to show pictures and talk at the same time. <laughs> but I will do my best here. Um, okay. So I was born and raised in New Jersey. Um, I'm a child of the 70s and the 80s. This is a picture of me, probably circa, I would say 1977 or so. Um, I think I was about five. This is my first solo show. Um, and it's also my most recent solo show. <laughs> uh, my one and only. So we'll see, maybe that will change soon, hopefully. But um, yeah, so far this is it. Um, but I did always take art lessons as a child. My parents were very encouraging of me and my sister to, you know, follow our passions, find out what we were interested in. I was not interested in sports. I was not interested or good at ballet or any other kind of dancing. So I kind of found my way into art classes instead. Um, and I had one, I, I went to this one art class that was above a fruit farm um, and in the attic above a fruit farm. And it was a woman named Cricket called Cricket's Corner Studio. And basically she had files and files of images of anything you can imagine, um, art, like pictures of any type of flower or animal. Um, and we would just go there find a picture of something that we felt like drawing that day and basically just sit there and plagiarize it, <laughs> um, plagiarize and copy, um, which actually ended up being a good way to learn how to see things and learn perspective and how to see things in space and um, learn to draw them. So that was kind of the first uh, experience. And then I, um, was lucky enough to have a really supportive um, art teacher in high school um, who saw something in me and nurtured it and recognized some sort of ability. Um, and I'll say shout out to Miss David if she ever watches this recording um, because she really was the one that encouraged me um, and ended up getting me into a program called Young Artist Workshop. Um, which was at Moore College of Art and Design in Philadelphia. This was a couple of hours from where I lived in New Jersey. Um, this is Moore here. It's right in Center City. Um, the fountain you see in the foreground is Logan Circle. And that was our, we used that as our swimming pool on hot days um, when I was there. But Anyway, it was Young Artist Workshop was a program where I was able to um, do portfolio development the first time. And then I ended up getting accepted into a second semester of it, which was uh, life drawing. So um, I was going down, driving down with my mom every Saturday morning before the sun came up and spending about three hours um, drawing the figure. And that was my senior year of high school. And then I ended up choosing more as my college. So um, I started attending school there in 1991. And more is a really unusual 
college, unusual college experience. It's the only all women's art college in the country, um, founded in 1848 um, as the Philadelphia School of Design for Women. Um, there are some alum, alumni of note that went there, um, like Alice Neal, um, the painter, Adrian Vittadini, um, Kathy Butterly, the sculptor, um, Dom Streeter, who won Project Runway recently and also won, won uh, Project Runway All-Stars. Um, and the singer Pink went there, but ended up dropping out to become a rock star. So I think she made a good choice with that <laughs> career path for herself. Um, it's, it's one of, it's the only all women's art school in the United States. And it's one of two in the world. And the sister school is called Joshi B, which is in Japan. Um, and that was founded in 1900 before women were allowed to attend art school. Um, so I went to Moore and I thought, for some reason, I thought I was probably gonna study illustration. I thought maybe botanical illustration because I was interested in plants and flowers and I thought oh I could, what if I just had a job where I got to draw plants and flowers and got paid for that um so that was my first thought but then I discovered textile design and um learned how to weave pattern design shibori silk screen all that good stuff um that goes into textile design and uh, we had, it was kind of a weird time to be in art college in the early nineties. Nothing was really computerized yet as far as, you know, learning Photoshop or learning computerized looms or weaving. I even remember um, the school telling us that they had this thing called email that you could sign up for in the library if you were interested in having an email account and, I thought, well, that's so dumb. <laughs> Who would want that? <laughs> so it was just like that weird early 90s time for all of us and time to be in, in school learning. Um, but I did okay. And I always, I always had an interest in fine art, even while I was studying design and textiles. And at the time, I don't think they have it anymore, but um, they had this really cool program that you could apply for for a fifth year and um it was tuition free so they accepted just a few students to do a fifth year um tuition free but you had to study something different than what you had gotten your degree in um so i did that and i studied fine art and that's when i kind of started the seed of being interested in painting and um, and that kind of has always followed me through life that in that other interest and sort of like this split between my love of textiles and design and my love of painting and fine art. Um, so this, this is some propaganda from the school that's me. Um, just about Philadelphia. I think it was some enrollment. Um, I don't know what that was, but anyway, that's me. And then this is me um, at my first job when I moved to California. Um, I got a job as a rug weaver um, in San Francisco for a company called Specialty Textiles. So we wove, we wove rugs for the interior design industry um, on 12 foot wide looms. So this is me. The first day of my job, I was not even able to operate the loom because I was too small to push the treadles down <laughs> to the floor to lift up the harnesses. Um, and I just thought, oh my God, I'm gonna get fired. I can't even, I can't even work this loom. Um, but I finally figured out it's sort of a maneuver more than brute strength that you need to, uh, to get those down to the floor and, and, and lock them into place. Um, and then we also got uh, computerized looms, so I didn't have to use the big treadles 
at the bottom, we just had a, a pneumatic system that lifted everything and the pattern was programmed in um, ahead of time. So it was also more automated. Um, so that's me. These are blurry pictures because they're photos of photos from back then. And then the only reason I included this one is because I, I specifically remember these rugs that I wove were for the actress Glenn Close. Um, and usually we didn't know who the person was that we were weaving these things for. But in this case, my boss had to fly out to her house to install them. And she told us that it was Glenn Close. And she also told us that she had the, the knife from Fatal Attraction framed <laughs> in the same room where these were installed. Um, so then this is kind of between this and now there's a pretty large gap where I, life just got in the way. I, um, I stopped, I stopped being a weaver of rugs um, for two reasons. One was because my company moved, they relocated from San Francisco to Chico. Um, and I didn't really want to live in Chico. Um, I wanted to stay here. And I also developed a, um, I developed a repetitive motion injury called costochondritis. Um, which is the, it's the inflammation of the cartilage that connects your ribs to your breastbone. Um, it's a really painful condition and it, it was caused by having to throw a shuttle across um, 12 feet over and over every day, left to right, right to left. Um, so I really wasn't able to do that work anymore after four years of doing that. Um, so I kind of did a lot of different things. I worked retail. Um, I had an art studio in Oakland that I went to here and there. I made some mediocre art, which I didn't even look for photos to include because I <laughs> just didn't want to go down that rabbit hole. Um, I, uh, I just did a bunch of things. I started focusing on my career. When I turned 30, I wanted to buy a house um, in Richmond and uh, art just took a, a back seat for me for quite a while. Um, and I wrote, I wrote this because I wanted to remember. I spent many years, like 15 to 20 years separated from my art practice. I think that's the time span since it didn't happen all at once. The artistic drive just petered out slowly until I wasn't actively making art anymore and I had no idea how to start again. My hiatus from art making brought shame, guilt, and a huge sad hole in my life. But creativity is like a little blue pilot light. I did just enough to keep it from going out, but nothing was cooking on the stove. By 2019, I had a little flame burning but needed a way to nurture it and the 100 day project became that for me. So the 100 day project is a, um, it's, on, it's a project on Instagram that is usually from, I think it starts in April and goes through July. Um, but basically the idea of it is for 100 days, you make something every day. Um, and you post it on Instagram and it doesn't have to be art related. It can be anything. Your project can be dancing or, you know, anything really, anything that you do for 100 days as a practice. Um, so I had watched friend artist friends doing this for a while and I always wanted to try it, but, um, I didn't really get the courage up to try until 2019. And that was my first one where I did a, um, a collage every day, a six by six inch collage. Um, so this was the first one and then I'll just click through. Um, I made them quickly in the evening after work. Um, I noticed that they all, I tried to do something different every day instead of 
having them all look the same. There's a little weaving thrown in there. Um, and it was really interesting to see how after 100 days, you see themes sort of develop. Um, when you think everything looks different, suddenly you start seeing that there is a pattern and there is some sort of consistency and themes that go in and out. Um, so this is the hundred of them all at once in a grid. And then in 2020, I did it. I did the art. Um, it's also the hundred day project, but I also started hashtagging artist supports pledge on Instagram because we were in COVID by then. And a lot of artists were really struggling um, because their courses had been canceled and galleries were shut down. Um, so an artist in England, uh, his name's Matthew Burroughs, um, started this hashtag artist support pledge. And the idea was using that hashtag to um, sell your work and everything must be sold for $200 or less. Um, and then once you made a thousand dollars, you bought a piece of art from another artist. So it kind of kept the money flowing throughout the art world amongst artists, buying art and selling their art to each other basically. So um, I made a hundred more collages that were all this a little bit bigger, a little more rough around the edges. Um, they're all kind of eight by ten, eight by ten to nine by twelve in size, um, and I sold eighty-two out of a hundred. Um, I sold them for sixty dollars, or sixty dollars, or two for a hundred. Um, and with that, I was able to buy three pieces of art from artists that I was admiring um, on Instagram. So these are just examples of some of them. Um, and then we are getting, uh, this is also 2020, um, towards the fall when we were having the fires and we were sort of like all stuck inside, um, keeping out of the smoky air. I wasn't able to get into my studio because the smoke had infiltrated the studio so I was indoors and I ha I found this I had found this branch on a walk um, that I thought was interesting it looked like a slingshot to me and I thought well I'm gonna see what would happen if I make it into a little loom and put a tapestry in there so I kind of thought oh this will be a one-time little project little comfort comfort COVID project um, and it just went from there and I kept making them um, part of the fun of it was finding the branches on my daily walks and figuring out each branch and what kind of challenges it um, presented to me. This one was kind of inspired by Hilma of Clint paintings. This is from a rose bush with the thorns cut off. This one's just a teeny little piece of a vine. I don't know what kind that I found. Um, so then this is a group of them. And I, this is a photo because I, I was discovered by a woman named Karen Ward on Instagram who saw me weaving these and asked if I would teach a class on how to do them on Zoom. Um, to, she runs something called Curiosity Art Camp, Curiosity Camp, I think. So it's basically, um, it was like a winter art camp for adults where you just got to learn fun things and because it was winter they were like cozy the idea was hookah or like the danish idea of comfort and cozy um so we would have our candles going and people would teach different things like cooking how to cook certain things or um make whatever and i got to teach 
my branches to, I think it was about 30, 35 people from all around the world um, on Zoom. So that was really fun. And then into 2021, so CVP is um, an art course online that I took. It's Creative Visionary Program, which is inspired, uh, it was started by Nicholas Wilton, who's a local artist in South Alito. Um, his company is called Art to Life. And he teaches painting to artists of all levels. Um, and I can talk to you guys more about that if you're interested, but um, basically these are, he, he teaches you to work in a series um, always. So um, this was, these are some of the pieces from my series. I'm, I'm interested in paint. I'm interested in um, abstraction, but I'm also bringing my little bits of collage into them if I can, because that's, um, one of my major interests is still working with collage and incorporating it into my paintings. Um, so this is me learning to paint um, as a midlife beginner, which is a really fun place to be, learning something new at any time in your life. Um, I think I completed about 12. There are 12 inch square pa wood panels. And then this is a little movie of, one of the things I learned them from this course is to not be afraid to take chances and risk and cover things up and change things in paintings and build up layers and history and, um, work back in. So this is all one painting here, just different phases of it. These are notes I gave myself. And then that's the finished one. But all of the, the whole series works that way. You just keep building and layering and sanding back and finding texture. Um, and then I decided it would be fun if I could figure out how to incorporate my weaving into the paintings. <laughs> so I took one and I hacked a, a hole in it with a jigsaw and drilled some little holes to create a tiny little loom inside the painting. Um, so that's what you're seeing there. And then this is the full, this is the full panel with the weaving embedded into it. Um, and then we have current. This is just a picture of my work table in my studio. Um, I know there's a lot of collage artists out there that are really organized with their materials, organizing things by color or size. Um, I'm not one of those artists. I need to have a huge giant mess just spread all around that I rummage through and find things. And um, yeah, I've never, I've tried to be more organized, but it just doesn't work for me as far as the creative process goes. I need to have a giant, giant mess all around. Um, and I, I, I kind of think of collage as like auditioning, like I'm auditioning this, pa this piece of paper to see if it works and trying like a hundred different things um, to get to the point where I'm happy with one. And these are, I did the 100, I was back to the 100 day project in 2022. I skipped it in 2021 because of the painting, um, but I came back to it and I wanted to, these are all 12 inch um, collages on paper. These are just a few of the 100. I, I like to use a lot of scraps. I use like old envelopes, mail, notes, um, pretty much anything that comes in the mail, I look at it and wonder if it would be good for collaging. 
And then I did um, do a little flash sale um, on Instagram and sold nine of them for uh, Planned Parenthood. I was able to raise $1,800 pretty quickly for Planned Parenthood in one day. Um, so that felt good because <laughs> it was it's pretty sad time. Felt good to be able to do something. And then this is, um, let's see, this is a time-lapse video of me working. I, I just put a bunch of, I oftentimes I'll put a bunch of paper up on my garage door and just play with paint, color, um, stencils. And then this all becomes collage fodder. So I tear it down into small pieces and, and incorporate it into my collages and my paintings. Um, but I, I was posting these time-lapse videos online and um, it caught the attention of a woman who was writing a book called Collage Your Life. So she reached out to me and asked if I would be a collaborator on the book um, for an artist prompt which what ended up becoming this, where it was working really, really big to make something small. Um, so this is a great book. If you guys get your hands on it, it's uh, you can order it through bookshop.org um, rather than Amazon. It's on Amazon too, but I like bookshop.org because it supports uh, small books bookstores and it's a great book. I've learned a lot, even just reading it, um, just seeing what other artists, other collagists are doing. Um, so this is a couple of mine and it's talking about the prompt here. Um, cover a wall with paper, gather up several paint colors and brushes and start layering with colors and patterns. Let the drips happen and have fun. And then on, on the side, it says pro tip, works best with good music playing. <laughs> This is another one that they put in for um, some of the color basics. And that's another one that ended up in the book. Um, so that was really fun. And then this is, uh, my goal now is kind of scaling up my paintings since I've been working so small. Um, so I got, somebody asked me to do a commission which um, for their home in Colorado. Um, and this is a diptych, which is four by six. Um, so that was my first time ever doing anything large. And it was a little scary, but she was understanding and let me take the time I needed to uh, figure it out. And till we were both happy with it, we kind of worked back and forth and I showed her progress photos. Um, so that is that. And then this is the state of my studio today. Um, I, I took this just before um, getting on this call. Um, so I'm, I'm learning, uh, I, those two in the background are four feet wide each, four feet squares, um, smaller works on my table, but um, that's me going big. And then I wanted to show some artists that um, I'm inspired by. These are my art crushes. Um, all current artists. This is Susanna oh, Bauer. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, wow. incredible. Wow. So wow. these are um, these are all leaves that she's doing like crochet to, like tatting. I believe almost like a lace making technique. Yeah, you guys check the check her work out. She's incredible. Oh. Wow. I, I had such a hard time just picking three to put into this <laughs> slideshow. They're all so beautiful. And then um, another one is Nino Uinardi. He's up in Seattle. Um, and what I really love about his work is just his freedom of just letting paint do what paint does um, and also not being afraid to cover things up, um, yeah, color. I love his colors. I love the freedom and the composition 
Um, and then this is my final one, which is Terry Frolish, who I'm lucky to know her in person. She was one of the coaches and mentors for the CVP course that I took. Um, her studio was also in Sausalito in the ICB building. Um, but I just love, love, love her paintings. I love her use of color. I love how she transitions between colors. Um, I love how they're like neutrals mixed with brights. And then this is, uh, she. she's a big fan of my branch weavings and I'm a big fan of her paintings. So we decided to collaborate. So this is a, an example of one of her paintings that I used as an inspiration for um, this weaving, which I just finished today. Oh. Um, but yeah. Oh. And then these are just a couple last photos. This is, a, I'm getting, working smaller and smaller and smaller <laughs> on the weavings. This is a wishbone. My latest obsession is uh, moving from on um, from branches into wishbones. And I purchased um, 83 of them on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's nice. So yeah, these are, um, this is sort of a mandala of wishbones that I'm slowly starting to fill in with weaving and we'll re-photograph it when it's all completely woven wishbones instead of empty ones. And then um, I just wanted to read this that I wrote, weaving my true love gives my brain a workout and centers me over and over again. It teaches me patience and problem solving. It doesn't let you rush it. There is a concrete beginning, middle and end and a special rhythm in the repetition. I used to weave big on big looms for my job. Now I love keeping it small. My, my branches and bones are their own loom handheld as string becomes tapestry. When I struggle with painting, I turn back to weaving. And when I need a break from weaving, I crave the mess and spontaneity of painting. I love them both. Painting is like going for a run and weaving is like yoga. And that's it. Very, very wonderful. Thank you for your presentation. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for listening. It's uh, five oh six, but we have uh, we have time for a few questions if you'd like to uh, ask them. Um, it, yeah, Casey, um, I'd like the title of the book again that you worked on. It it looked like it had so many playful um, prompts, and I, I'm transitioning back into painting from you know still doing photography, but. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am real excited about uh, the openness and creativity possible with that. And that book might be a fun, um, what shall I say, how to. <laughs> it's a great book. It's called Collage Your Life. Collage. Um, it's by Melanie Mowinski. Um, it just came out this year. Um, and there's, I think she has over 50 collage artists uh in the book and then 10 of us were contributors to the different prompts so okay. i highly recommend it <laughs> casey are you still working in the um art field no i work full-time in sales um i work in one of the interior design showrooms in san francisco which is actually the showroom that sold the rugs that i used to weave for the <laughs> The industry, they they knew me um, because of that, because I was on the manufacturing end and now I, I'm in sales. So I work full time and commute to San Francisco every day. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I tried the branch weaving uh, myself and I, I, was, I did not love my results. I love your <laughs> results. They're, they're just terrific, beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, if you want to try it again, I'm happy to provide some uh, tips. That might be the best possible answer. Yeah. <laughs>
it can be very tricky to keep the tension nice because especially if the branch is moving or too flexible. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have another one as a uh, former weaver myself. Um, I have a lot of fabrics that, um, that I wove when I was doing art to wear. I still have a bunch of them. Well, how have you been able to incorporate those or have you into your collages? I mean, I, I saw you going in to, uh, you know, and creating a weaving structure within a defined area of, of a piece that you're working on. But what about taking the fabric and chopping it up and giving it dimensionality? And have you tried that? I have tried that. And I, I think that's a great way to use like old scraps of fabric, tear them up, you know, yeah. fray the edges, glue right. them in. Um, that, that one commission that I showed, the larger one, I actually did incorporate some fabric into that. And I also took some old like paintings that I didn't like and tore them up into small pieces and then collage them on to the big canvas. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Any other questions? Well, this isn't exactly a question. I wanna thank you for showing Terry Furlick because I just met her a, a couple months ago. Uh, I'm a member of the Marin Photo Club and one of our projects was to photograph the artists at the ICB and then um, share those photographs uh, with them. And we then put them on display at the building in, in, in one of the uh, first floor studios. And she was, uh, she was great. And, and it became for me a project because we were initially assigned three or four artists to photograph, but I ended up photographing 24 of the artists in the building. Oh, wow. Because the building itself is an absolute delight. Mm -hmm. um, it's three floors, over a hundred artists. And when they have an open studio, it's just wonderful to walk around. And uh, most of them don't mind being photographed and uh, they're invariably polite, uh, and the work there is extraordinarily diverse. It's like mm -hmm. a, going to a living museum where you get to meet the artists uh, and see their work. And uh, so I strongly uh, recommend going to the next uh, open studios, which I believe will be in early December. Uh, mm -hmm. I recommend that too. There's, um, it's such an interesting group of artists and they, I love it when they have their artist at work open studios, which is them really like working in their studios on pieces instead of just like cleaning everything up and displaying art, you get to see them in action. Um, and Terry is, is just wonderful. Yeah. She's been super supportive of me as a beginner. Um, yeah, so definitely stop in and say hi to Terry if you if you end up over there. Nora, one last thing. I wanted to make sure that you track down a woman named Josie Iselin, I-S-E-L-I-N. She does these great seaweed pictures that she prints on banners and I think you two should like marry your beautiful work right she's got the seaweed you've got the jellyfish and she's a local person she's a local woman can you spell our last name again please yeah I-S-E-L-I-N I-S-E-L-I-N yes okay. all right okay thank you hey Bill can you, can you say where the studio is you were talking about again? If you go over to Sausalito, uh, I uh, can't remember the uh, cross street, but it's uh, opposite the Molly Stone uh, market. And um, there's plenty of parking uh, adjacent to the building. And um, I attended the, the uh, artists at work and, and I agree with Casey that's, even better than the open studios, but uh, 
the impoverished photographers uh, can't always choose their best uh, venues. And so uh, it's very easy to find. Right. It's very easy to find parking. And there's there's interesting restaurants nearby, too. I Take think it it's on I think it's on Bridgeway. Um, yeah, if right. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah, it's just off Bridgeway. Mm -hmm. Say the name of it again, please. ICB, which stands for Industrial Center Building. It's a repurposed building from the Second World War. Three stories tall. Uh, once you'll see it, you'll uh, find it hard to believe you ever missed it. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I, I just want to say, Nora, I, I did see your uh, display at the post office, and I'm just amazed. You're so inspiring. And you too, Casey. You're just so inspiring. It's been a lovely way to spend a late afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. Yeah. Thank you very here, much. Here. One, other question, one other question for Casey. Where can we see your work in person? Um, good question. <laughs> I right now I pretty much am just showing my work on Instagram. Um, but I'm hoping to show it in person at some point soon. We'll have to figure that out. And I might. I might do an open studio at my house, like towards the holidays. Um, so if I do, I'll make sure to invite everybody. Yes, please, please. Okay, well, many, many, many thanks to Nora and Casey for taking us through your very inspirational art journeys. And thank you all for joining us today too. Um, this concludes our artist talk for today. And I hope you'll join us in January, we will have our, our next one. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks Irene. Irene. Thanks, Bye. Irene. Yeah, Thank thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear it for the moderator. Cheers for the moderator. <laughs> oh, that was, um, I was I, Irene Hightower. I'm, I was the host. Mm -hmm. Okay. All okay, right. Bye-bye. Like Bye-bye.